So Pastor Adams out with his dad this week, enjoying some time there, father son time. So uh, he asked me if I'd uh, give the message today, and I kind of looked at what we've been doing uh, since this summer. We've been in the book of John. And Pastor Adams, over 20 Sundays, has led us through words and the preaching of John. And some of the lessons he taught us over the last five months, here are some of the titles of those lessons that we, that we received. Behold the Word, behold the light of the Word, of the world. Behold the Word made flesh, not to be served, but to serve. The heart of Jesus for you, let not your heart be troubled. Jesus loves me, this I know. Abiding in Jesus, hated for Jesus' sake. The heart of Jesus for you. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, our Lord's Prayer, the trial of an innocent, the cross, the death of our Savior, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you may believe and grace for sinners like us. So when you look in the Bible and you see the book of John, what do you think or remember about John and what it was about? Well, there's a lot to be said about John. Some simple things would be, well, he was Jesus' cousin. He was born six months before. But you know, the most important thing about John was he was the one that was prophesied to pave the way before Jesus. And that's all I'm going to say about John, because today's sermon is not about John, but it's about what John was about, Jesus. So I'm thinking we've all come to better understand what the gospel is over the last five months. So I'm going to be that favorite teacher that you all had that said, good morning, everybody. Clear your desk and get out your pencils. Pop quiz. <laughs> but, you know, this quiz is going to be a little different. It's only going to have four questions. What is the gospel? Why share the gospel? What is God's role? And what is our responsibility? My main point today is why share the gospel. But before we do that, we got to ask them, up. what is the gospel? So this quiz is a little different because I'm going to give you the answers. So you can all take a breath and uh, be uh, assured that you don't have to stand up and give an answer today. So what is the gospel? Well, the word, if you split it in half, the first part of that word is G-O-D. Well, it was in the old English, it was G-O-G, goad, which meant good, and then spell, which meant news, or a story. Actually, the Greek used a word called euangelion, which meant good announcement, uh, with a kind of a royal context to it. So, basically, gospel means the good news. And in Christianity, good news refers to the story of Jesus Christ, his birth, his death, and his resurrection. So today, people are longing for good news. Something to hold on to that won't let them go. They desperately seek hope, and they don't know where to look for it. And they don't even know if they can have long-term hope. But we have the answer, don't we? If you look to 1 Peter 3.15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to anyone who asks you of the reason for your hope, for the hope that is in you, and give it with meekness and fear. So if I asked you today to start a conversation with the next person you meet and tell them and share the gospel with them, what would you say? What would you tell them? Of all the scripture and all the prophecy and all the verses that are available to you in the Bible, what would you tell them? Well, that's what I want to share with you today is a way to do that. And I want you to see that no matter how complicated the world wants to make it, no matter how many people want to make it confusing and hard for others to understand, the gospel is very simple. God didn't want it to be hard for us to come to him. So here's how simple it is. Four things. Number one, God loves you. Number two, we are all sinners. Number three, 
God has a remedy for sin. And number four, all can be saved. That's how simple it is. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. So God loves you. If we look to John 3, 16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it starts with love. Specifically, God's love. And no matter the situation, people can always relate to the need to be <laughs> wanted and to feel loved. And God does love us. You know, God loves humanity, and his love is so great, and it is ultimately displayed in him sending his only son to save us from our sins. A lot of people read John 3.16, but they don't read to the next verse. John 3.17 says, For God did not send the Son in the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Again, a demonstration. God loves you. And it starts right there. So God's love is the good news, but there is some bad news. The second thing is, we are sinners. If you look to Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If we look to Romans 3.10, again it says, None is righteous, no, not one. So sin is real. We are all sinners. If I was asked everyone in this, every sinner in this room to raise their hand, I think there'd be some reaching for the ceiling right now. But I'm not going to ask that. Instead, I'm going to ask an easier question. Anybody who's not a sinner, raise your hand. Right. So even the most spiritual person you know is a sinner and needs the salvation and saving of God. Right. So what did, what did we just talk about? It starts with love. But we are sinners. But guess what? God has a remedy for that. If you look to Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life, and Christ Jesus our Lord. The first part of that verse is the bad news, right? The wages of sin is death. And what are wages? Well, wages are what's earned, right? It's your payment for the work you have done. So, the wages for sin is death. Death is the payment for sin. And that's death not of your body, but of your spirit and your soul. Because, you know, your body's temporary, right? Our time here on earth is temporary. Our body's going to pass on. It's not going to live forever. But your spirit, your soul, the part that makes up you, that lives for eternity. So wages of sin is death. That death is the eternal death, a separation from God. Sin separates us from God, but that's the opposite of what the intended relationship was. God wanted a relationship with us, but because, because he loves us, right? But because of our sin, we have to put that separation between us and him. Because sin cannot exist in the same space as God or with God, or in heaven. So, the wages of sin is death. However, after that bad news, there comes some good news. The second half of that verse says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what is a gift? Is it earned? No, a gift is not earned. One simply receives that gift in order to take possession of it. You can simply agree to receive that free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according, in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So we see Jesus needed to die. He needed to die as a substitute for our sins. 
Sin requires payment of death. Sacrifice, blood, death. And Jesus was our substitute. I was, this morning I was spending a little time looking at some things and somebody sent me a text with a YouTube video and Mahaya and I were kind of laughing at it this morning along with Zach. But it was kind of a metaphor little skit that somebody did. It was called the good old meter. You want to look it up on YouTube, you can. But basically, it, the metaphor was two angels were standing, you know, up there and, and there was a line of people coming up. And as each person came up, they would pull out a file on that person. And the file had white papers and red papers in it, symbolizing good and bad things in that person's life. And there was a scale with an arm on it that said bad and good, right? And so they would look at the folder and they say, well, you've got some of the good things and you've got some bad things, but get on the scale. The person would get on the scale and the scale would jump back and forth and then it'd go down and it was like not good enough. And they would say, okay, you need to go over here. Of course, over here was a waiting room for the down elevator, right? So the line kept going, right? And people had some good things and some bad things. And some people say, well, my, my parents went to church. Doesn't that matter? They'll stand over here. Well, you know, I cheated on a test, but the next day I cleaned up the trash in the park. Doesn't it even out? They'll sit over here. And it, they kept going through all the people and they finally got to this one guy. And there was some red in his folder. And they said, well, this doesn't look too good. And he said, well, I, you know, I tried to be the best I could. And they said, well, get on the scale. And as he started to step on the scale, an arm came out and stopped him. And there was a guy standing there with a shirt that said, Jesus. And the angels were like, oh, we didn't know you were with him. And they said, well, we still got to do the measure. Get on the scale. So the guy starts to get on the scale, and Jesus says no. And he gets on the scale, and of course you know what it read. Boom, all the way over to good. And they said, okay. So then Jesus puts his arm around him and takes him over the side and takes the folder with all the red pages in it and throws it away. That is what Jesus did for us. When the time comes for you to stand on that scale, guess what? You don't have to. Jesus has already done it. He will step in your place because he's already taken the punishment for your sin, for my sin. I don't have to take the payment of eternal death and punishment because of Jesus. So we see right here in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, it says Jesus died. Furthermore, he remained dead and buried for three days. It was also necessary that he rise from the dead to prove that he had power over death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? It's not there. Because if you believe in Jesus Christ, he gives us that eternal life and that power over that eternal death and separation from God. All of this happened in accordance with the scriptures. Prophecy that was written way before these events ever happened. <laughs> So we've learned God loves you. That's where it starts. We're sinners on our own, and our payment is death. But God has a remedy through it, and it's the free gift of Jesus Christ. We just have to accept it. So lastly, we can all be saved. Right? Romans 10, 9 through 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So it's not enough to simply believe. James 2.19 tells us that even the demons believe and they shudder. Confession is an expression of your belief. Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, if you believe. Believe in your heart, right? A repentant heart will admit sin, be sorry for sin, and ask for forgiveness. Believing that it is possible, 
because of Jesus. A repentant heart. Let me say that again. A repentant heart will admit to sin, will be sorry for that sin, and will ask for forgiveness, believing that Jesus Christ can make the difference. Not long ago, I was in a Long John Silver's having lunch. And as my friends and I were sitting there, there was a young lady who was bussing and cleaning tables. And she came by our table and was picking up our, our trash and the things we had left over. And so I wanted to thank her for that. And I reached in my pocket and I pulled out a small Bible, a New Testament that I always carry with me. And I, I gave it to her and said, thank you for cleaning up. And, uh, and uh, as we were talking, we begin to discuss that very thing, how God loves you. And we talked about it. I said, have you ever read this? And she said, no. And I said, well, look right here how God loves you. In John 3, 16, and John 3, 17. And then I talked about how we're sinners, right? In Romans. And then I talked about how God had a remedy for that. And I explained what the wages of death, or the wages of sin was death. But the gift of God was eternal life in Jesus Christ. And we talked about that. And then we got to the part about how you could be saved. And so I asked her, I said, what do you think about that? And these were her words. I'm shocked. No one has ever told me that before. That just cuts to the quick. And that's part of my point today. Why share the gospel? Mark 16, 15 says, and this is Jesus, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus' mandate to his disciples was pretty straightforward. He said it and repeated it several different times and in different words. So the question is, is there still a need to evangelize? There's over 5 billion lost people in this world today. Uh, but that's okay. There's people witnessing, right? There's others out there sharing Jesus and showing them the way, right? Well, let, me, let me give you another number. A survey was done, and the question on the survey was whether or not you witness and share Jesus with other people. And the survey came back. How many born-again Christians talk about Jesus Christ and witness to non-believers? percent. That means 95% of Christians don't. And I'm not here to ask you to say, well, where you're at in that percentage. The question is, where do you want to be in that percentage? It's important. And let me give you three reasons why it's important to share the gospel. Number one, the primary thing that matters in life is one's relationship with God. Number two, eternity is forever. Number three, the good news changes everything. So let me speak to each one of those. The primary thing that matters in life is one's relationship with God. You know, you can't take anything with you from this world. When we all came into this world, we came in with nothing, right? Not even clothes. You can't take a, anything with you out of this world. Has anybody ever seen a U-Haul hooked up to the back of a hearse? I don't think so. You know, many people spend a lifetime obtaining the ideal life, filled with accomplishments, achievements, applause. Yet, what do those things mean for eternity? God is clear in his word that a relationship with him is the only thing that will last. Actually, it's the only thing that you can take with you when you leave this earth. Number two, eternity is forever. You know, people often don't think about eternity. Forever. That means no end, right? We live for the here and now due to our self-absorption and our self-centered culture. How sad would it be for the whole world to know your name, yet you spend eternity separated from Christ? Hell is real. Jesus spent more words speaking about hell than he did about heaven. The reality of eternal punishment gives us pause, 
When we think of those closest to us, how are, how are my neighbors going to heaven or hell? What about my family workers, etc.? When you think about those, it gives you pause. Eternity is forever. Hell is real. Three, the good news changes everything. Jesus and his gospel is the only thing that can completely transform a person's heart and life. In a world that's spinning out of control, God's still active and his kingdom is still expanding. So what are the three reasons we should share the gospel? Because the primary thing that matters in one's life is relationship to God. Nothing else, because you can't take anything with you except that. Eternity is forever, and the good news will change everything. So you know, when that, when that young lady said to me, I'm shocked, no one has ever told me that before, my heart cringed. But I did ask her, now that you've heard it, and now that you understand it, I want you to read this book. Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now when you sit down to dine with somebody, it's not just anybody, it's someone you've got a relationship with. And that's what Jesus is saying. I'm right here at the door, I'm knocking. Do you want to open the door and let me come into your life have a relationship with me. And when I asked that young lady that, what she wanted to do, she said, yes, I want to do that. And so we stood right there in the Long John Silvers and we prayed. And she prayed with a repentant heart, with a believer's heart, and she accepted that gift of eternal life. She believed with her heart and she confessed with her mouth. So I kind of want to draw toward the end here and talk about the last two questions because we just answered the first two. What is the gospel and why share the gospel? But when it comes to sharing the gospel, I think I'm talking to a room of Christians here. What are the answers to those last two questions? What is God's role and what is my responsibility? So if you look to John 6, 44, it says, and Jesus said this too, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Think about that. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. You know, that, that right there is kind of a, uh, get out of, you know, kind of a free card, right? Because that relieves you of the pressure of potential failure in trying to share the gospel, doesn't it? Think about it. How many times have you said to yourself, what if I say the wrong thing? What if the person asks me a, asks me a theological question and I don't know the answer? If they reject what I share, will I feel like they're rejecting me? If I get it wrong, will they end up going to hell because of me? Does anyone have those questions in your mind as you think about talking to somebody else? Like the question I asked in the beginning of this, of this uh, message, if you had a chance to talk to a stranger today when you walk out, what would you tell them? Are you held back because of those fears? Well, guess what? Jesus said, no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. What does that mean? That means that no matter how well you articulate it, no matter how well you tell the story, no matter where that person is, you're not going to be able to convince them because nobody comes to Jesus unless the Father draws them first. That's why to so many people, it's a great mystery because it's been hidden from them. God hasn't drawn them to him yet. And your place, our place as Christians, is to remember that we have to be faithful in sharing and telling people, and we have to leave the work to God, right? 
When we realize that no one can come to Jesus unless the Father who sent them draws them, we become aware of God's role in this. This means that we do not save anyone. Our job is to simply pay attention to what God is doing and we share the good news with them. We need to put our trust and our confidence that God will move people's hearts. And many times you will encounter people in different stages of that. Some have just had a seed, had the seed planted, and that's all. Others may have had a little watering on their seed and there's some growth going on, but they've gone no further. Others, they're already starting to bloom, but they just haven't made that final decision or realization yet. You never know what kind of person your encounter is going to be about. But you do know this, it wasn't you, it wasn't me, it wasn't what I said, it wasn't what I'm going to say, it's what God is doing in that person's life. God draws them, God saves them, right? So now that we're clear on what God's responsibility is and role is in this, what is ours? Well, I would say there's three things. That we pray for sensitivity to the Holy Spirit in our own lives. That we pray for open doors. And then we pray for boldness. What I mean by that is, when you want to pray for sensitivity to the Holy Spirit in your own life, where is your alignment? You should be aligning with God's Word and the Holy Spirit's leading in your own life. I know you've heard the Holy Spirit speaking to you before. There's been some prompting before, whatever it was He wanted you to do. Maybe not sharing with somebody, but something else. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading in our life, and we need to align ourselves with God and His Word. Also, you do that through devotion, right? Spending at least 10 to 15 minutes a day in prayer, in reading, and memorizing God's Word. Be able to go to it when we need to. Praying for open doors. Pray for those moments that are God-ordained for you to share the gospel with somebody. Because if you pray for it, and you say, God, would you let me meet somebody today that I can tell them about you? Be ready, because I will. So pray for those open doors, those God-ordained moments when you might be able to have a conversation with somebody and help them understand the simplicity of the gospel. Pray for boldness, because we need it, right? You gotta be bold to be able to tell somebody about Christ. So pray for boldness in sharing the good news and trust God for the words to say at the right time and the right manner. Because if you trust him to give you the right words to say at the right time, he will. Because what has happened before you start speaking to that person? What has happened? God has already drawn them toward him. You just have to be happy with me as God. Right? So let's see. I guess at this point, I can say you can put your pencils down. The quiz is over. And what, did, what was the quiz? What is the gospel? Why share the gospel? What is God's role and what is our responsibility? So I'm hoping that I've answered those questions for you. And the next time the pop quiz comes up, you'll be ready. So let's take a moment right now and pray. And if the praise team will come up and prepare to do the invitation song, I would ask everyone to take time right now to pray. And if you wish to come and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, because you never have, then you can come. And if you wish to come for any other reason, please come. But everyone, please pray in your heart right now. What is on your heart right now as we listen to the invitation song? Come.